Attention vegans, uh, how, how's your brain? How's your heart? How's your wellness, uh, as they say? Because uh, this episode of the Vegan Life podcast is sponsored by California walnuts. Uh, now, like all walnuts, they're the only tree nut that contain a significant amount of omega-3 ALA, which is good for your heart and overall wellness. I expect you're wondering, what's ALA? It's not Allah as in Allah mode, although they are quite good on ice cream. Uh, it's alpha linolenic acid. That's an omega-3 fatty acid. And it's really good for your... Uh, blood cholesterol levels. I didn't know that. What I did know was that it's really good for your brain. That's why I should eat more California walnuts. Um, because uh, literally, your brain is made of electrical circuits, and your brain takes oil uh, and 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 makes up the circuits out of out of the oil, right? And if it hasn't got omega three, it's like it's okay. I'll I'll use omega six, which is I don't know, like marge or something, and and it makes do, but it's not as fast a connection. So literally, you need the omega-3. And, you know, vegans, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's hard to come by, but it's, it can be elusive. Handful of walnuts, that's going to sort you right out. Uh, so why don't you grab yourself a bag of California walnuts next time you're shopping. Uh, make sure you check the pack for Produce of California or Produce of USA. If you want to find out more, well, they made a website. It's www.californiawalnuts.co.uk. Now you know. <laughs> And welcome to the podcast. How are you? Are you okay? I never asked that. You're all right. Um, we thought we'd do something a little bit different this time. Uh, we thought we would look backwards. Uh, we would look at the, the history of veganism. How did it come about? Why did we... Who did... How much? How much? Uh, I've got a nice quote, I think, uh, which, you know, if you're, if you're vegan, uh, this, this might mean a lot to you. It's from Robert Kennedy. He says, Few will have the greatness to bend history itself. But each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. I know. Written for vegans, that one. Uh, anyway, let's meet our panel. Paige Curtis is a Boston-based writer covering the intersection of environmentalism and pop culture. She's most excited by community-based solutions to the climate crisis and reminding people of the rich environmental history found throughout the African diaspora. Saren Charrington Hollins is a food historian, period cook, author, broadcaster, and consultant. How do you do? I've always wanted to be consultants. One of those words like business leader. I always <laughs> want to be a business leader. I don't know how you do that. Anyway, <laughs> Saren has a great passion. How did you do it? How did you become a consultant? I want to do that. So back in two thousand and seven, I had a bit of a switch in career, basically, where I went from just sort of lecturing on history and and rabbiting on about food in my spare time. Um, and I was sort of demonstrating then for National Trust and for CADO, which is the the Welsh version of English heritage, basically. So I was sort of very often found weekends donning medieval costume at various heritage sites, uh, talking about, you know, the fact that there's a lot of misconceptions actually about medieval food. And it's not just that people just uh, devoured huge amounts of meat, that there was actually a lot of of plant-based food being yeah. So I was just doing lots of sampling and things like that. And 2007 arrived and basically the business had built to the degree where I was doing more and more advisory, more and more consultancy with people like National Trust and um, decided to branch out on my own. And uh, and the rest is history, as they say. Well, it's yeah, it's all history. I mean, uh, so I, I, the reason I'm not a consultant is because you have to have expertise. Uh, that's just not a thing uh, for me. Uh, Abilasha Chandak is a returning guest from our Spice episode. Uh, she's a food consultant. Oh, another one. And a celebrity <laughs> chef. She's travelled to more than 30 countries to explore their culture and cuisine. She was a finalist on MasterChef India 2016. And she has her own show on Amazon Prime and YouTube, which I still haven't got around to watching, for which I feel very guilty. Um, welcome, all of you. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I thought maybe what we could do before uh, we go into the questions that people have asked about... Mm -hmm the history of veganism and also food generally um, is is maybe we could talk about just the history of veganism to kind of get through it. Because Dom asked the question, where does vegan or plant-based food begin and how far back does it date to where people or communities made a link between their food and the suffering of animals? So I've got some bits here and doubtless you can tell me, you know, where it's 
gone wrong or true or whatever. But apparently uh, it can be traced back to ancient Indian and Eastern Mediterranean societies. Uh, vegetarianism was first mentioned by the Greek philosopher and triangle nut Pythagoras of Samos around 500 BCE. Is that right so far? Am I right? Yes, it is. Is that why Dairy Lee is... No. So... Um, <laughs> In addition to his theorem about Dairy Lee, uh, Pythagoras promoted benevolence among all species, including humans. And then followers of Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism also advocated vegetarianism, mm. believing that humans should not inflict pain on other animals. I, I don't know about you, but I do. When I meet a Buddhist who's not a vegan, I kind of pull this face. Do you do you do you guys do that? No, not of course. Not. <laughs> because the wonderful thing about vegans is that we're not judgmental yeah not at all we just don't do it uh anyway apparently the meatless lifestyle wasn't really much of a thing in the west although i, I sarah and i want to find out more about the medieval diet um but it would sometimes pop up during health <laughs> crazes and religious festivals the ephrata cloister a religious sect founded in 1732 in Pennsylvania advocated vegetarianism as well as celibacy. Hang on a second. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, then in the 18th century, there was a utilitarian philosopher called Jeremy Bentham uh, who believed that animal suffering was just as serious as human suffering. And he likened the idea of human superiority to racism. Uh, but that was a long time before Twitter, so he got away with it. Um, the first vegetarian society was formed in 1847 in England. And then, I didn't know this, the Reverend Sylvester Graham, who invented Graham crackers, mm. like s'mores, right? The s'mores guy, co-founded the American Vegetarian Society. Um, so I'm guessing he didn't use marshmallows in his s'mores because they've all got jelly. I didn't know that either. No, I didn't know that. So he was a Presbyterian minister and his followers called Grahamites because ego, uh, they obeyed his, his instructions for a virtuous life, vegetarianism, temperance, abstinence, and frequent bathing. Now, just wait one second there, Graham. I'm, I'm, I am not behind much of that. In November 1944, bathing, come on. Uh, a British, we're all past that now. We had lockdown. A British woodworker named Donald Watson announced that because vegetarians ate dairy and eggs, he was going to create a new term called vegan. Vegan. Yes, to describe people who didn't eat them. Tuberculosis had been found in 40% of Britain's dairy cows the year before. It's the badges, mate. It's nothing to do with... And Watson used this to his advantage, claiming it proved the vegan lifestyle protected people from tainted food. Uh, yeah. Three months after he coined the term, he issued a formal explanation of the way the word should be pronounced in his new Vegan Society newsletter. I'm kidding. Uh, which had 25 whole subscribers. He said it's vegan, not vegan. Yeah. Did you know that Twitchlets are vegan? Uh, by the time Watson died at 95 in 2005, I mean, 95 has got to be something in it, hasn't there? There were a quarter of a million self-identifying vegans in Britain and two million in the US. And it's growing. Mm. Uh, are there any meaningful bits of the history of veganism that you feel I've I've not covered there? During the sort of Victorian period, there were a lot of campaigns, actually some of them twinned with temperance campaigners. Yeah, see, I cannot. But go on. Mm. <laughs> but they, 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 you know, there were there were campaigns that were suggesting um, that uh, you know drinking tea and abstaining from alcohol, etc., was very good. It was also suggested by some temperance movements at the time that also abstaining from meat uh, was a very good good thing. Now it was done on two levels because when they were looking at working class diet, they were advising against them wasting and squandering money on alcohol. Um, and so they were also saying that actually a vegetarian diet, uh, a plant-based diet was cheaper. Um, uh, and, okay. you know, you have to consider as well that um, during that period, you know, meat was not as widely consumed as a lot of the Western diet today is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meat consumption was lower amongst the the average household. So if we took an average household today, um, you're going to see a higher meat consumption. 
and higher processed uh, food consumption. So they suggested actually that, you know, things like um, vegetable broths and, and very light meals could be very sustaining for people. They right. also looked at it from another perspective because there's always a different way that they look at it and they said you know eating all of this meat was going to cause people to be very red-blooded and um, they were looking at it was actually a great way of uh, making sure that people didn't get into a sort of the courtroom for fighting and various other things. They were literally trying to make us less fighty. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and I think you know looking back as, as well at sort of the medieval period i think this is big misconception that you know vegetables weren't eaten you know yeah. and that, that salads weren't eaten that it was all this sort of you know because you see it on television and it, it's documented where there's all these great big meat feasts and they've all got some sort of um, animals limb in their arm you know chomping away yeah. um, and that actually wasn't the case and, and i know we'll sort of probably dip into that a little bit further on yeah. but it's sent for the average person you know they were not there feasting on all of this meat meat was very difficult to come by it was very expensive yeah. um and it was certainly for the higher classes but there was certainly an awful lot of vegetables consumed as well i assume that my ancestors yeah. basically just ate cobbles and bracken but we will touch on this a little bit more abilasha yeah, I think uh, in the Hindu culture, as you mentioned, we have uh, mentions of vegetarianism in the Rig Veda. There are four different Vedas and there's Rig Veda, uh, which mentions veganism, vegetarianism, not the term vegan, but, you know, in the sense that love animals and have a flesh-free diet sort of a thing. And uh, I think you're very right when you say the Jains, the Hindus, the Buddhists, I mean, basically where I come from, <laughs> exactly in India, they really had it, uh, we have written evidences as early as 7,000 BC. Wow. That, uh, I mean, there was this town of Mehergarh where this was found uh, and uh, there was written history as well. So yeah, it's, it goes down. Amazing. Paige, yeah. anything, can you can you beat 7,000 yeah. BC? That's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but I, but there is a very long history of plant-based and vegan eating um, out of Africa. I know that Ethiopia has a very long history of plant-based food. So does Zimbabwe, Ghana, a lot of these nations. Um, pre-colonial times eat a lot of like small grains, leafy greens, legumes, nuts primarily was their diet. Um, they may have done, done some hunting and gathering to sort of add meat as more of a seasoning component. It was more of sort of a side thing. It, it was very much not the center of how they ate. Um, it was only when European colonists came that they brought farm animals and sort of domestication of, of animals like beef and cattle um, or, you know, cattle and goat and chicken and all of that. And that became more of a, a dietary staple. So definitely a long history of veganism out of Africa as well. Amazing. Okay. Well, that's great. Basically, the West sucks at all that. I think that's what we're, we're saying. Um, okay, let's jump into some of the questions people have sent in. So Janet says, are paleo diets historically accurate? Well, now that's an interesting question. Sarah, let's start with you. Well, I mean, the problem is with, with this, I mean, I, it sort of sounds like I'm going to sit on the fence here. But the issue is that really we don't have that much evidence um, right. of exactly what a paleo diet would have been. I was going to say, you know, like, in a nutshell, what is what is it that is purportedly the paleo diet nowadays? Because well, I, they're, I they're, haven't really I mean, followed that. Basically, what, what they're saying is that we should be eating what we were between 2.5 million and 10,000 years ago. So it is the hunter-gatherer diet. That's okay. what we're looking at. We're looking at the caveman diet, essentially. Okay. So a lot of these things that get, and this is where I always get a little bit annoyed, is that in essence, we don't have a lot of information. Um, it's reasonable to sort of, you know, deduce things from looking at skeletal uh, remains, etc. But my issue is that Paleolithic diets would have been extremely variable. And this is the reality of it. They wouldn't have all eaten vast amounts of meat, um, you know, or, or vast amounts of any particular thing. It would have depended where you lived. So there would have been regions and time period differences. Yeah. So, for example, if you lived by the coast, it would be normal to expect that they would eat whatever was in abundance yeah. and they could get. So that may have been fish. But yeah. if they were also living in areas that were very 
uh, lush and, and heavily planted with, with berries and things like that, then they would have been gathering that in and nuts and anything else, grains that they could have eaten. So it doesn't just go, ah, right, well, they just went out every day and clubbed an animal. <laughs> they weren't good, just yeah. these huge corpse cl- crunches. And to me, a lot of the paleo diet that gets promoted today is not actually reflective of what our ancestors would have eaten. It just reminds me a bit more of towards an Atkins diet almost. Mm-hmm. You know, you get people saying, oh, they're just going to consume all this meat. It's going to make the weight drop off you. There's a reason for that. <laughs> well, you know, we need a balanced diet. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, they would have certainly, they were hunter-gatherers, our ancestors. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it would have been what they could have hunted and gathered. I think that the modern paleo diet tends to be focusing on the hunting bit. This may have been hunting as in hedgerow hunting. (laughs) Right. Yes. We should, we should, we should be eating uh, sparrows. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I tried pterodactyl patwizzlers and uh, they weren't great. Um, (laughs) The the paleo, so, so the paleo thing is quite, it's quite meat heavy. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? A, a lot of the things that I've seen in yeah. modern, uh, you know, interpretations of it, and it, it may not be the original idea of, of pushing forward a paleo diet, yeah. but of course people catch on to the idea like every food trend and it suddenly gets metamorphosed into something else. Yeah. You know, the original idea of paleo diet, of course it's normal to assume that our actual digestive systems and, and, and uh, you know, metabolism, I should say, has not altered that much yeah. throughout history. Our metabolism hasn't changed dramatically. So, of course, we will suit a more natural diet. We yeah. will suit a diet that our ancestors had. That That is normal to assume. But I think what's happened is for a lot of people, and I am generalising, but a lot of people that catch on to the idea of a paleo diet for weight loss, et cetera, which is what the media does to these things, um, it just seems to be focusing very, very heavily on the meat yeah. sense of things rather than looking at, you know, natural grains, natural fruits, natural products, which is yeah. what it's all about is minimum processing really yeah. is what it should be about. It should be eating more, should we say, whole foods than than sort of just, um, you know, looking at corpse crunching. This does <laughs> seem <laughs> this does seem a bit like the sort of Fred Flintstone view uh, yeah. of, of what we ate back in those days. I mean, it seems like a pretty sort of whole food based diet, really. Mm. Paige, do um, you do you tend to follow that kind of diet generally anyway? Yeah, I I personally don't. I think this is kind of curious the way that maybe food and culture kind of kind of meld together in in, in this case. I think paleo is definitely more of a cultural trend. And I think the trend underlying really is like people know now that it's like better to eat seasonally and like locally. There's a lot more awareness of like wanting to eat local foods, um, being aware that food changes throughout the seasons, you know, and so I think there's definitely more cultural leaders to see around why it's important to kind of eat alongside the changing season. And I think that is enough that I kind of aspire to sort of be more so is the importance of knowing that like, you know, where I am, there's more squash and like pumpkins are more hearty in the winter. So I'll be eating a lot of that versus like summertime. So I think that is kind of the cultural tidbit that I think is worth talking about the sort of rise of people knowing that it's kind of um, makes more sense planetarily and sort of bodily to eat alongside the seasons. I think paleo does encourage that. That's a good point. Um, do you, Abilasha, do, do you, what do you, what's your sort of general diet? I think I kind of resonate with what Wade said that, uh, you know, eating local seasonal, uh, what's, what's around you is, makes more sense than, you know, following some sort of a fad. I mean, mm-hmm. it used to be history, but today the way it's packaged and sold, I think it's more, it's becoming more of a fad. So lots of meat and vegetables, no grains, no sugar, no dairy. Mm-hmm. I don't think I buy that. I don't. No. Okay. Well, I I always take care of my food miles because I I buy everything <laughs> from from my corner shop. I don't think I quite I haven't quite got the hang of that. Uh, right. Laura says Westerners use meat and dairy substitutes such as ackee, jackfruit, tempeh. Uh, and are these ingredients used from their indigenous countries in the same way as we use them? I'm pretty sure we've completely butchered. Nice bit of uh, punnery there. These foods over the years. So I'd love to know how Caribbean people use ackee or Indian people use jackfruit, etc. Um, Paige, you want to start this one? 
Yeah, totally. So ackee is a really important food in the Caribbean. Um, it's from a fruiting tree that is I think, native to West Africa um, and came to us via the slave trade. Um, it grows very well in the tropical climate that we have in the Caribbean. So definitely has become like a staple in a lot of Caribbean cuisines. Um, also kind of cool tidbit that ackee as a fruit is actually really poisonous if it's not ripe. So there's a whole kind of like knowledge around how you know when it's ripe to pick if you're an ackee farmer. That's really important to kind of think about. Um, but yeah, it's so in, so in Caribbean food, we use it more as like almost an egg substitute. So when you boil it and kind of mash it up, it kind of resembles scrambled eggs and it has this creamy, almost delicate flavor. So it's a really great like breakfast staple. Um, and it's also part of our national dish in Jamaica is ackee and saltfish. Um, not vegan entirely, but ackee is just a really important um, kind of uh, staple in the food. Um, it's also really hard to find because it has to be like obviously farmed and canned out of the Caribbean. It's hard to find fresh ackee anywhere else. So if you're in the West living is in... There, is there a big difference between like yeah, canned and fresh ackee? It is. It's going to be, it'll be in sort of a, 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 salt, a salted water, right, for, to, to, to preserve it. So when you get it canned, it's just not as fresh, not as, um, not as um, creamy. Um, so definitely a difference there in the in the taste. Um, we also do use jackfruit fruit a, a good amount in the Caribbean as well. There's um, a long history of people from India coming to the Caribbean. Um, so there's a lot of influx of that in the in the food culture, and jackfruit is kind of another staple that um, is used to supplement. Um, kind of resembles like um, um, pineapple or mango or banana. It's a really nice flavor. Um, so we use that as well a lot in the um, Caribbean foods that I know. And are we like has has it been somewhat hijacked by the vegan movement in terms of how we're cooking it and treating it now? I I, I think broadly I think I think broadly veganism has been really whitewashed like, culturally. Yeah. Um, I think one of my aims in writing about food is trying to decol decolonize the movement, so trying to like unearth these histories of non-white vegan traditions. And I think, yeah, like I think not knowing the history behind Aki, for instance, is probably an example of, you know, of, of, of the kind of whitewashing of, of how it's been used. Um, yeah. I would definitely say so. Hey, the West was last to the party on the veganism movement. You know, I, I think we could show you guys a thing or two. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we could. I'm so not qualified to be here. Um, Abilasha, uh, what about you? Uh, you know, I can go on and on about jackfruit because in India, we cook it with in so many multiple, like, you know, in multi ways. Uh, I mean, in Bengal, we make this uh, curry with it. Uh, the Again, using the five spice, uh, panch mm -hmm. and curry as it is. Uh, it's called kathal. Uh, jackfruit is called kathal and we make a kathal curry. I mean, in the south of India, they will use some curry leaves and mustard seeds to, to make a different sort of a curry there. And... Then there is jackfruit jam, as she mentioned, like, you know, it almost tastes like mango and uh, uh, papaya and stuff. So it's used in desserts, as salad, as filling. It can be used raw. It can be used cooked. I mean, you can make it with some coconut milk, some bay leaves. So you can even make chips out of it for all you know. So, you know, it's, it's diverse. And I don't think that, you know... It's actually, in a way, yes, uh, the vegan people have kind of butchered it and are not using it the way it is used in India. So we, we could definitely learn a few things from there. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it's more about like just opening ourselves out to, to, to more fun ways to enjoy it rather than yes. slathering it in barbecue mm -hmm. sauce and pretending it's exactly. pork. <laughs> Correct. Uh, Saren, uh do you find, you know, is, is this a thing that's happened in food history a lot, you know, whereby ingredients get appropriated by other cultures? I think um, the British, we are great culinary magpies. So we borrow most things. And, and Borrowing I just, may, might be a generous term. <laughs> well, I was being nice. Sure. But if you look at what we do to dishes, I mean, you know, we, we created spag bowl. Uh, for goodness sake, you know, we took the Italian cuisine and this is You're what welcome. we do to You're it. Welcome. So oh, when I look at things like, um, you know, pulled jackfruit, I just think, you know, I think we missed the point because 
that's not what it's about. And I think actually the whole idea of meat substitute, you know, and it, it having to act as something else instead of using the ingredient as a great ingredient in its own right. That's where the problem is. And I think we've also missed the point of we use a lot of tinned jackfruit um, in this country. And we miss the the difference between the the sort of the sweet ripe jackfruit uh, and the savoury unripe jackfruit, okay. and I think that that's got lost. You know, kind of the, like a sort of papaya thing, I guess. Yeah, you uh-huh. know, it's that that sort of you know we don't because we don't particularly when we borrow something we don't particularly. <sighs> Um, read the rules, really. We don't read. Do we not? How unlike us? There we go. How we go. Like us? <laughs> no, we just sort of go. Do you know what? We we can make a Chinese curry, and and then Vesta is the result. You know. Yeah. So. I've kind of I've kind of realised like any 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 sort of historical podcast, and I, I did a history podcast for a year. I did a daily podcast. Um, sort of about what happened on this day in history with someone, and I re- the whole thing was just an apologia for being British and basically wrecking the world. Um, sorry, sorry, everyone, we did that. <clears throat> You're welcome. I'm just going to say to you, look at Pick a Lily. Uh, you know, Pick a Lily is a British creation. It's based on something that we uh-huh. saw, same as with Bolty, same as with all of these dishes. We just get something, go, we quite like the idea of that. The Victorian curry would be a very good example of that. You know, you know, we've got people that had travelled um, and then came back and sort of tried to explain to an English cook, this is what I had. Right. And they just went, well, we have similar ingredients. <laughs> you know, it's okay. nothing at all, nothing at all like it. Um, but that's what we do. And that's what we do very well. We are good at slaughtering culinary um, <laughs> culinary dishes from other countries, you know, um, because yeah. we, we do do this idea of we absorb things mm-hmm. and we take a dish and change it. Um, to suit our own culinary tastes. That isn't always a good thing, but it is what we have a history of doing. You know, I'll go ahead and say that uh, you make everything bland. You're welcome. <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, let's true, take away true. all the flavours and just make it bland. And, mm. yeah, you know. Just boil it. You boil like boil everything everything sauce. That's what it is. I mean, if you look at some of the dishes we've done in history, the, the main flavour of it is Worcester sauce. It seems to go in everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a that's a that's a fair. Uh, Sorry, fair I had to say it. <laughs> no, it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely right. Paige, um, there's a new mayor in New York who ah. is basically vegan, right? I think he had diabetes and he adopted a vegan diet and you know, his sort of health improved dramatically. Mm. And it's an interesting thing where he, he talks about um, uh, the, like um, a lot of black people in, in the US, uh, they eat a diet which um, they sort of consider to be part of their culture. But his mm-hmm. take on it is this is a legacy from slavery. The food that you're eating wow. is actually culturally it's 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 a leftover from slavery and it's mm. bad food it's a bad mm. diet um is that right yeah. and can you talk a bit about that yeah that is definitely um an active debate i think happening maybe in, in the black food world in terms of um food of the american south which you might think of as like as traditional american food is southern cooking um so food that was often like off cuttings that slave slaves were given um so like off cuts of fat or like organ or or organ meat from, from, from different, um, animals, sort of leftover foods that they were given as, um, as scraps really, that they turned into like really rich food, um, back then. And now has been reclaimed by now black Americans as like Southern, Southern cuisine. So really like really, um, a lot of butter, a lot of oil and meat heavy food. So yes, there is some, there's some debate around like that being linked to the health problems that we're seeing in the black community in terms of like high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes linked to these really um, um, unhealthy foods. And there are others who say like there, there, there's a way to eat vegan in that tradition as well. Like there, there, there are ways to kind of have, um, to have um, okra and like to have leafy greens and cooked, cooked the same way with, and um, to not include meat that you can sort of still practice veganism any healthy way and still enjoy Southern, Southern cuisine. Um, so there, there's, there is an active debate around that. Um, 
I also, uh, I think it also is important to kind of say that like, um, there is this notion in, um, in the U S at least that veganism is still a very white thing to practice when actually I think black Americans are more likely to practice veganism today. And it's like times as likely to practice it. So, so it is definitely, a, um, a, a diversifying movement in the U S um, the face of it is really changing and there are more black vegan chefs now who are trying to enter the scene as well in the States. So I think it's, a, it's controversial to, it, 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 I think it is really controversial to, to, to kind of say that like black food is inherently unhealthy. I think that's the kind of notion that we're trying to, um, to correct. Cause that, cause that's not true. Thank you for that. Cause I was, I was kind of fascinated when I, when I saw what the mayor was saying, I was like, okay, I, I, I need to learn more about that. <laughs> um, Abilasha, is there a food, like what's a food that comes from your culture that has not made it into kind of the West, as far as you know, that you wish would. There's so many. There's so many. I, uh, there's some that are overdone, like turmeric. Um, yes. That I can say for sure. <laughs> and when there are so many, you know, ingredients, there's so many different local spices that we use, local herbs that we use. They have uh, not just, you know, they're not just tasty, but also have medicinal properties. And they're very local to a particular region. I don't think that's traveled uh, because even, I mean, it's not traveled across India. Why talk about across the globe? So yeah, there are pretty much a lot of ingredients. I mean, on top of my mind, I can think of this. There's this uh, leaf called kulakhara, and uh, I remember there was this one time when uh, my hemoglobin went down, and uh, I kind of had, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people talk about spinach and beetroot and stuff, but mm -hmm. this was like, you know, I used to have like a shot of this, not a turmeric shot, not a beetroot shot, but a shot of this juice, uh, this green juice, very bitter, very very bad to taste. <laughs> But then it was just fantastic. It worked wonders for my, like, you know, uh, for my hemoglobin. And uh, I mean, I, I, it's unbelievable how so many of these ingredients are not spoken about. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the, the, other, the other thing that I can think of, you would never hear these names even. There's something called chireta. It, it really reduces your blood sugar levels. And uh, mm -hmm. really, you know, if you have a shot of it in the morning after a run, it just gives you energy for the entire day. I think these are secrets that people don't want to share. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I can understand that, to be honest with you. Um, Saren, we've, we've lost that whole connection of that idea of, you know, I, I read something somewhere that, you know, everything you eat either heals you or harms you. And we've, yeah. we've lost that kind of connection with the idea of, you know, your, your diet is so closely yeah. tied to your health, haven't yeah. we? I yeah. think we have. Um, I mean, uh, sort of taking it from a Western perspective, again, the idea of going out into a cottage garden, picking herbs and, and vegetables, you know, and it all growing in the same border almost, you know, and, and, and hedgerow picking. Um, I still go hedge, hedge bothering. Um, <laughs> but actually people's knowledge of what's growing in a hedgerow, what is edible, what you, you can find, you know, growing in a field, um, has gone because people now want very, very tidy gardens. They don't sort of go for the cottage garden. They don't mm. grow so many herbs. Or it tends to be that people people's herb repertoire is very limited. Yeah. You know, so it does go to sort of the parsley, the basils, you know, yeah. rosemary, thyme. That's it, really. These are the things that you see commonly used all the time. But, you know, things like lovage and making tonic wines and, and things like that, that is, is also a British tradition, um, as much as it belongs to other traditions as well. We all have our own unique little traditions. And I think we've lost a lot of our seasonal eating. Mm. We've lost a lot of our certainly our herbal law and the, the idea of edible flowers as well. It's all gone sort of crazy now where it's like all become very chefy and, you know, yeah. you get these little edible flowers presented, but the actual meaning behind them and the culinary properties of them hasn't carried forward. It's now on the prettiness and always oh, isn't it beautiful. I can take an Instagram photograph, lovely, but mm -hmm. there's properties within those actual yeah. botanicals yeah. and that's what's being lost and and that's a great shame really because i think you know there are for example you know rose 
I use roses a lot in cooking, but it was also used a lot in British cooking. It's now we look at certain other cultures and we go, they use flowers in the cooking. But I've always said the Victorians were the great era of, of flower power, but also looking at Tudor cookery. There was an awful lot went on in the still rooms there that, you know, they brewed and they they used flowers, not just for appearance, but actually for those real botanical uses. Um, and I think that knowledge is sadly being lost, which yeah. is a great shame. Paige, I'm guessing there's there's a lot of kind of Afro-Caribbean tradition of kind of food to heal you. Yeah, totally. Um, and if you can imagine, you know, during slavery times when slaves had no access to like healthcare, for instance, like they very much were relying on um, uh, plant knowledge, on uh, knowledge of the land and, what, and what, what grew when to kind of heal themselves um, for medicine, but also kind of, kind, of, kind of for nourishment day to day. So yes, I think that is kind of now becoming, I think it's kind of coming back now. There's definitely a resurgence of herbalism in, in, in pop culture at large. I think most people now have some relation to it. They might take a supplement or they might, you know, I don't know, yeah. have some, some, some knowledge of it. Um, but I think it's definitely coming back and it's important to remember. Definitely. Okay. I'm conscious that um, I've I've rambled all over the place and we haven't <laughs> got through many questions. So I'm going to smash through a few. Mike says, this isn't really a vegan food question. I love this question. He said, I'd love to know when eating in restaurants became a thing in either our country or around the world. That's a mm. fascinating question. When did we start going somewhere else to eat food? Uh, Saren. I think um, today, you know, eating out is 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 more of a social thing. It's not about getting fed, is it, anymore? You know, yeah. I mean, we eat out not just because we need sustenance, but we eat out because it's something we want to do. Um, it's an expression of sort of lifestyle now. But I think in the past, um, where you've got to look at this dining out comes from is it was actually – an essential thing to do. Um, so it, it was more for sort of survival, really, in terms of long travelling. You know, there was no nipping about the place by rail or or mm. car or or anything else. It was something where you were going on very, very long journeys, uh, often by carriage or by foot, you know. Um, yeah. You look at the pilgrimages and, and things like right. that. So, you know, where this starts is, um, you know, you've got sort of, people having to stop off and eat. Mm. But what I would say is that when you look at those ideas of dining out, this was not like today's dining out. These did not have elaborate menus. Mm. This was the chef special every night. Yeah. <laughs> when I, you know, and that's being nice about it. This was going to be a very basic food. It would be the basic food that would be found in a poor household or at best in a merchant's house. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be very basic fare. Nothing wrong with it, no. but it was going to be basic food. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is that restaurants, I mean, they've been around in one form or another for thousands of years. Um, but the growth of restaurants and the growth of, of eating out has come as cities have grown and as industrialism has grown. Because um, it's brought with it, you know, markets and those markets have then bought more traveling. You've got people selling, you've got people buying, you've got people needing to eat away from home. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's that's where it really starts. You've then got obviously things like in France, um, you know, we've got sort of the the sort of after the the uh, revolution, uh, a lot of the dissolution of guilds, food guilds, meant that a lot of even high class chefs, such as your, you know, even those that were working very very wealthy houses, actually found themselves unemployed for want of a better term, and they set up restaurants. This then, you know, they were bringing a better class of restaurant, a restaurant right, right. that we would be more recognisable to today. I know, like everything. You know, these culinary trends catch on. In Britain, um, there's, there's a couple of very key things that happened. Um, dining out for women was not a thing. 
Um, uh-huh. This was not the done thing. Women did not eat out in pu- public. Of this course. is why the afternoon tea caught on, because it was a way of actually entertaining uh, and okay. having, uh, you know, people round to enjoy some food. You, you Women didn't dine out. There was only a certain type of women that frequented um, the sort of the places that served food outside of the house. And they certainly weren't the type of people you'd be af- inviting back to your afternoon tea. Yeah. <laughs> But the idea was that men may have dined out in chop houses, may have dined out in in taverns and inns or gentlemen's Mm. clubs. Mm. But the real turning point is the First World War, actually. Um, We got um, the the idea of sort of national kitchens going on. And those kitchens were really low class restaurants where people ate communally. Um, It didn't last after the first world war but it was a place you could get a good cheap meal um and it was a good way of making sure that everybody was getting food second world war restaurants were very important as well because it was a way of supplementing your ration basically you could get a meal out um at varying prices um and i think just gradually the whole dining out culture has now caught on and it's become more social. After the Second World War, as we got more economic um, resources behind us, you know, the general sort of um, sort of average wage really went up and people became wealthier as the generations went on. That's when dining out really became more of a thing. And sort of by the 60s, we're looking at a lot of foreign travel and a lot of uh, foreign influence. And that's really when we start to see the dining culture that we know today really beginning. Abilasha, what's, uh, you know, what do, in, in India, what, in terms of eating out, when did that become a thing? I think uh, it's pretty much what actually Saren said, travel, uh, when the merchants, the businessmen, uh, mm. the travellers were travelling, uh, they were carrying good amount of food with them but at some point they did run out of it and so they had to like you know ask someone for food and that's exactly how the whole culture of uh you know dining out or restaurants came into picture and it's not like the modern day restaurants it was more like the inns where you would where you would be just like you know staying over for the night and the person you're staying with or wherever you're staying is making you some food Mm -hmm. just making you food to fill yourselves and not for the taste or for anything else. There were times when there was just, you know, a person with just the one kind of dish, like just yeah. one single dish, day in and day out, and that's what that person's serving. Yeah. So, and you, it would still be a restaurant technically because it's some, it's a service that you're getting paid for, yeah. right? And that's a restaurant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Uh, so in India, it was pretty much that. It yeah. was the businessmen who kind mm-hmm. of gave initiation to the first restaurants. And Paige, do you think it was the same? in terms of Afro-Caribbean culture? Yeah, I would say it's probably a a, a little bit different, I think, in um, sort of uh, pre-colonial West Africa and Caribbean, like there were always food stalls, right? So if you were someone who like worked the land, if you had a small small garden, you would go to market and sell your wares and you might stop at a food stall to get a meal for the day. And that was always an affordable way for people who were in the peasant class to to dine out, but also to get their... um, their needs met in terms of food day to day. And and that is still very much a sort of core part of um, Caribbean life is sort of going to a food stall, getting lunch on the roadside to be a cheap meal. And so you can kind of um, eat pretty cheaply that way. So those, I think those were always really a staple to um, Afro-Caribbean eating. And then I'd say more um, in sort of modern times, I think um, restaurants was probably the the primary way that people could uh, actually ask being being entrepreneurs. So when they immigrated to the US immigrated to um, Europe, they were you know, having their own sort of food business. And that was very common in terms of um, accessing capital and kind of being their own business owner was having a restaurant. And that's probably how people kind of had, and grew to have a taste for Caribbean cuisine was probably going to restaurants in um, Europe and uh, the States. So that's what I would say. Awesome. I'm going to conflate the next two questions. Uh, Isa or Isa, I'm sorry if I got it wrong. I think it's Isa probably and Tamer. Isa says, how far back does spice go? And what kind of meals were eaten with chilies and spice in it? And Tamer says, has salt and pepper always been a staple? Um, Paige, let's come straight back to you. I mean, I'm guessing that's been as long as since we've been eating food, right? 
Yes. Yes, I would say. Obviously, salt has always been core to how we preserve, how we preserve food, right, forever. Um, I'd also say, uh, you know, again, as people think about the slave trade, people think about um, the Caribbean in terms of being a sugar and sugar, sugar cane um, source and, you know, of, of production. But also they were they are harvesting spices like the islands were really core to the, the spice trade. And so we see pimento, allspice, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, all having roots in the Caribbean, as well as like cloves, garlic, paprika, these very core um, spices now all have all were um, harvested and farmed early on in the Caribbean and were core parts of how um, the slave trade was able to go on for as long as it did was because of these really, um, really important spices was kind of what I would add. And Abilasha? Oh, I can go on and on about this. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think by now, Listeners know my love for spice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in India, spices uh, were actually used uh, as currency. Can you believe it? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, there was something called the spice trade, which is which was the world's largest industry at one point of time. And uh, India still contributes seventy percent of the global spice. So the numbers, are, the numbers talk for themselves. That you know, uh, yeah. I think uh, when we talk about the spice. Uh, I mean, the indigenous, the very indigenous to India, like cardamom, turmeric, uh, some form of uh, cinnamon. Uh, I mean, they were cultivated as early as, again, 8th century wow. <laughs> in the gardens of Babylon or whatever. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, uh, spices were actually used to make food last longer, like um, uh, Pate said. I mean, even today, there are places in India, there are villages where there's no refrigeration, no electricity. So they still use spices to preserve their foods. So, you know, it's it's still used as that. And um, again, there is a huge mention of spices in Ayurveda and how it was used for its curative and preventive uh, you know, properties, the various spices, how you would have a garlic for cholesterol and a ginger for you know, I don't know, something. <laughs> but yes, ginger, garlic oh, yeah. are good for health, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fenugreek is again a very good resistance builder. So there, I mean, spices are used for their medicinal properties for sure. I mean, I'm not overemphasizing and talking about turmeric because I think now the world knows. Yes. So yeah, pretty it's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. And um, Saren, salt and pepper. Yes. Where did that come from? What, why is that a thing? I mean, salt's been used from prehistoric uh, times. I mean, it, it is, um, as, as the others have said, you know, it's, it's one of those essentials for life. It's essential in not just seasoning and taste, but in preservation. You know, that that's, that's the thing. Um, so I think, you know, the methods for producing it and, and controlling it um, have generally fallen to sort of um major authorities really you know the major civilizations as well and I, I would say most notably the romans really um because i mean they left their mark on our modern language through salt so oh, yeah. if you look at salad you know that the roman word for for salt was sal and salad just referred to vegetables and greens that were seasoned with salt that's where oh. our salad comes from. And, and, you know, if you look at salary again, um, you know, that's where it comes from because it, it's hard to imagine salt being a payment today because if somebody, you know, if you went to do today's wage and I offered you a, a sort of a quantity of salt, I think you, you might sort of throw it back at me. But but it was known as white gold looking back at the Roman period and that's where salary derives from salt it was incredibly valuable. I mean, not just as the seasoning you throw on your chips like oh, you yeah. would today. I mean, this was, this was completely different. And I think during the medieval period, um, it was such an expensive commodity um, that it was controlled by the state. And, and also, you know, on your table, you would have these large vessels, you know, in, in solid silver or gold mm. um, that would sit on your table. And where you sat dictated what level you were in, in terms of social nobility. Um, so if you sat below the salt, then that was that you were of 
lower social rank, of lower importance. So um, being worth his salt, all of these terms, all of these phrases that we still have, all derive from the importance of salt. So having salt on the table was not about practicality. It wasn't about seasoning your food. The food was seasoned in the kitchen. Um, having salt on the table was more about wow, look, I've got all of this expensive salt here, you know, I can afford it, you know. And there were even um, etiquette books produced for the use of salt in the medieval period. And it, it advised that you didn't stick your fingers in the salt, that you use the tip of the knife um, in order to get the salt out. But I won't go into that. I know rambling on, but basically, I mean, it, it then it becomes a favourite with with. Um, Dishes, you know, with seasoning, we get the taste for salt, so to speak. And I think um, it then brings the companion of pepper. Now, one of the things is it was the late 15th century uh, when the Portuguese took over control of uh, Malabar in East India and they started large scale production. Of, of black pepper, it basically flooded the market and the price came down because pepper was very expensive. So it's only at this point in Britain that we start to be able to afford to use large quantities of pepper. We've also got to look at not only does it become more affordable and readily available, but also the French, we're culinary borrowing again, I'm afraid, but the French cuisine. Stealing. Let's just call it stealing. That's fine. Yeah. And, and we sort of then start adapting more of these French recipes using lots of pepper. And it takes till 1911. We are seeing salt and pepper side by side on the Victorian dinner tables, but 1911, Morden Company produce free flowing salt. That produces the salt cellar going on the table instead of the glass salts. Um, and then it's not long after that the pepper mill, you know, the pepper cellar comes at the side and salt and pepper by this stage, well established, salt and pepper go together. That's it. Amazing. Potted uh, history very quickly. Uh, amazing <laughs> there was salad and salary. I'm not going to look at anyone called Sally in the same way again. But um, uh, we've got the final question. Nadia says, you hear a lot about what rich people ate around the world in history, but you never hear about everyday people. I'd love to know what the peasant or working class ate uh, and if this would have been meat or unintentionally plant-based food. And we have slightly touched on this before. Um, Abilasha, would that be true that uh, lower class people ate less meat? Not necessarily. I, 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 I don't think so. Because you know what? Uh, I would, contrary to that, I would say it's not necessary that the upper class actually ate a lot of meat. The upper class also ate a lot of veggies. I mean, I have a nice story around it, actually. This is the story of biryani, how it landed to my city of Calcutta. And uh, uh, this was when Vajid Ali Shah came to Calcutta in, say, somewhere around 1850s. And uh, this was when we were under British rule. Yes. Mm. Uh, and uh, he was Sorry. very hopeful that, you know, uh, I mean, his dynasty called the Avad would be handed back to him. But that didn't happen. So he sent his mother, son and uh, a few more people to England, to the Queen, uh, to, you know, lay down a petition to say that, yes, we want uh, this place back. But while, while the negotiations were going on, this is I'm talking about 1857 when, when you know, uh, the revolt happened. So they, all the attention shifted to the revolt. Now, coming back to the biryani story. <laughs> so this is then, you know, uh, so he had he had a choice to settle in Calcutta. And by this time, potatoes were a very expensive ingredient. OK, potatoes, because they were not very common in Calcutta at that point of time. So he added these potatoes to the biryani. We cannot imagine potatoes in biryani, OK? Biryani is necessarily an entirely meat-based, meaty dish. Right. But then with this one, because potatoes were more expensive, he added them and it tasted beautifully because you know how it's a one pot meal where all the saffron and all the other flavors get infused and potatoes took all those flavors very, very nicely. And so they they kind of became something else altogether. Having said that, now potatoes are a staple food for the peasants. Because then when uh, they started growing it with more and more people coming in, potatoes coming in, they started growing more. So then, so what was once the food for the rich then became the food for the poor? Right. That answers your question in full circle. So mm. it doesn't necessarily mean 
that we haven't spoken about what the poor were eating. They were eating the same food, but maybe a little later. Right. Mm -hmm. Then things started becoming cheaper. That's a really interesting yes. sort of um, general observation, isn't it? That Am I right, Sarah, in thinking there's a kind of cyclic nature to all of this? Because actually, you know, so many poor people now in, in the UK certainly eat quite a lot of meat. You know, it's very processed, junky stuff, but it's the same with like white bread, which was the preserve of the rich for so long. Um, is that right? That it's kind of, you know, the aspirational foods get then made in bulk so that lots of people can afford them and then it fits? Uh, yeah, food, things that become fashionable, just like with all fashion items and food, it does follow fashions. Um, and so, you know, it, it does naturally, you know, you can come out with, one sort of food that's very on trend and then suddenly it's everywhere um, and things naturally become become cheaper. But I would also say that, you know, looking from a British um, history perspective, if we look at sort of the medieval period, we'd be eating lots of pottages. Now, that would be rich and poor would he eat the pottage, you know, um, and the pottage, you know, perhaps would be containing things like meat, beef or mutton. Um, but they'd also contain whatever vegetables, herbs could be acquired. But what went in that pottage would really depend on where you were in terms of social class. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean from the meat perspective, but it can mean from the spice perspective perspective if you've got a lot of money you'd have more spices and and right. expensive exotic ingredients whereas if you were poor class you're more likely to have you know sort of wild onions and parsley in there <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. it just depends and i think also it depends on what could be acquired so there would be times when it would just be vegetable based uh, for the poorer but there would be times when perhaps they got access to meat and that would depend on seasonal on what was preserved as well so i think um for 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 me it's more about the seasonality of eating because things were more dependent on on what could be acquired and what was in season rather than it being a definitive between you know meat vegetables and I think it's a little bit like if we go back in history and we look at sweet and savoury weren't divided in the same way that they are today. It was all blended and it was just in terms of people would eat what they could eat, what they could acquire. Gotcha. Paige, does that sort of generalisation hold up in terms of Afro-Caribbean food? Was there less meat in a poor person's diet? Yeah, I would plus one to what Saren said in terms of the peasant class and that being most people pre-independence. They were pro probably eating um, plant-based uh, foods predominantly just because meat was sort of more expensive. And also they, they were probably farming or had small plots and just sort of ate what they could off of the land. Um, we do, however, see post-independence from um, world powers that you know, the opening up of these economies, right? Globalization um, brought the introduction of different multinational food companies who are able to sell food uh, cheaper, so subsidized, right? And then we see the influx of like processed foods, meat and dairy from the US and other Western nations permeating these food economies that made meat more of a sort of staple in, in, in their diets now. So I think that is kind of important to call it, that there was a shift that happened economically that made meat uh, more desirable, but also cheaper for, for, for some nations. Um, there is a group, though, that did manage to hold on to their vegan traditions in the Afro-Caribbean, and that was the Rastafarian communities who practice Rastafarianism. And those are people who follow this faith tradition that does not uh, believe in eating animal products. So they call this idle eating, idle short for vital. And it's this notion that your food should be alive and rich with nutrients, right? And so processed food or meat is thought of as like dead food. Nice. So they are very strongly vegan in that belief. Um, and Rastafarians, you know, very common for them to have like small kitchen gardens or multi-acre plots that they're using for subsistence farming. They can feed large communities that way and kind of self-govern themselves at the same time. And so, um, so, so they definitely are kind of still holding on to that vegan practice, even through these kind of economic transitions. Um, so they're still making a lot of like vegan soups and stews um, that are largely plant-based. Fantastic. We, uh, we talked a bit about ITIL uh, in the last podcast we did together, didn't we, Abilasha, with uh, oh, cool. yes, we did. these guys. ITIL is vital. That's what I learned. Um, yeah. 
Guys, uh, we've come to the end. Thank you so much for an amazing... Uh, we sort of kind of compressed, well, 8,000 8, or 10,000 years of human uh, culinary history uh, into an hour, which I think is pretty good going. So well done. Um, before you go, where can people find you and the stuff you do? Abilash, let's start with you. Uh, people can find me on Instagram, on YouTube. Just Google my name. Uh and it's all by my name, Abhilasha Chandak, at the rate of Abhilasha Chandak. So just feel free to connect, guys. Do it. Uh, and Saren, what about you? Uh, yeah, if you go onto Instagram, um, I finally got myself on Instagram. So I'm under Saren Food Historian, or I've also got a blog, serenitykitchen.com. Perfect. And Paige? Yeah, you can find me on my website, pagecurtis.me, or on Instagram at Lil Uzi Cork. Thanks to all three of you. And hey, thanks to you for listening. Next time, we're going to be talking to Matthew Kenny. He's an absolute giant in the world of American vegan eating. Uh, in the meantime, you can always send us your questions about vegan food. It's podcast at veganlifemag.com. Veganlifemag.com is where you can find lots of stuff about the magazine. You can even subscribe to it there. There's an app, or you can just go to shop, get some fresh air, you know, do your work world of good guys do your world of good um i'm jake yap uh, I'm, on, I'm on instagram uh, so is vegan life underscore podcast uh, where you can catch up with m- more stuff why don't you why don't you get do you do it all do you do all that i do all that i don't know why i do all that i just do it that's what we do isn't it anyway um i'm rambling bye-bye <laughs>